will be a Q&A period uh, right after this session, um, and we would highly encourage uh, your participation. Uh, that's a big part of, uh, of this, this session right now. Um, Alfred Darlington, uh, who has been touring the world for over 20 years under the name Daedalus, uh, and helps, the bridge, helps bridge the gap between the creator and the observer. Uh, their artist profile bears no separation between their personal self as they engage the audience on and off the stage. Uh, I have been a big fan of, of Alfred's music for many years and uh, have had the pleasure of uh, interviewing them uh, recently, although it's my first time, uh, it's our first time meeting. Um, and it's, it's always really, really inspiring to hear their music as just as much as it is uh, th their sharing of knowledge, experiences, and, uh, and insight with, within the artistic community. So I'm honored to interview, uh, to, uh, to welcome Alfred, uh, AKA Daedalus. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's extremely kind uh, of you to say so, and also for Immersed, uh, Phi Center, Studio Feed, and, and even most importantly, you all here to be joining in this conversation. Um, the beginning of, I hope, many events that break down um, our sound environment and our physical manifestation, our identities, our political spaces, sound being central to all these extremely uh, difficult to sometimes vocalize ideas. Uh, I have the dubious and wonderful honor of, of talking about what a different panelist deemed to be not just a mental issue, but a physical issue of health, mental health, physical health, and also the practical matters of being a musician in this modern moment. Uh, I manifest that as an electronic musician, a performer, but at the same time, um, as just a person, a human, and there is gonna be some woe is me talk, and I apologize. It's so strange to be saying this out loud because we just never give ourselves the moment to speak on such matters, at least not my peers, not my friends. There isn't an opportunity to kind of uh, investigate and examine the, uh, the hardship because of how incredibly lucky I feel. I feel blessed in so many ways, I feel extremely touched by all kinds of privilege and possibility, but that isn't to take away the, the hardship, and that isn't to take away um, the universal difficulties. It is both in our modern moment and to express something pure and in general. Uh, so I'll start with a little background. Uh, I've been uh, wanting to be a full-time musician since I was very young. I think there was a moment in what we call elementary school in the States, and maybe it's the same, is it the same thing? Yeah, probably. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I look to you, all things. Um, where they brought in an orchestra and they had everyone pick an instrument, and I picked the bassoon. It's a terrible choice. And they said, no, you can't do that. You're too small and uh, it's a bad choice. And they put me on clarinet. Also, very tough instrument, um, both Physically, it, it, it asks a lot of your body. It, it has a lot of need, but also just not setting myself up for um, social success, which is... <laughs> that's perfect, though. It, it really is a running... It's going to be a running theme. I'm going to just get into it. So clarinet, wonderful, uh, difficult, embodied, and that was it. That was, I was kissed by this muse that was music. It was going to be my life in total. From that point on, I, I was a prisoner of a dream, of a passion, right? And later, uh, wanted more sounds. I wanted, I was greedy for sounds, and so I picked double bass. Huge physical instrument that demands a lot, but I was growing, and I could have picked bassoon probably at that point, but double bass. And, uh, and I rode that double bass all throughout university, becoming a jazz major, studying the instrument, and encountering a, a beautiful roadblock almost right away. My bass teacher at the time, who was this guy, John Clayton, incredible big band musician, he told me with all the wisdom that I should stop. I didn't have the talent. It, it was difficult uh, to hear, but what a wonderful gift given. 
because of course, by that point, I'd already been skipping class numerous times, going to raves and getting involved in DJ culture, not knowing how people made that music, not knowing how they embodied those sounds. It was all stuff floating in from the UK and, and at that time especially, and, and also these blips and bleeps coming from the Detroit, Chicago, and otherwise underground. And what sounds, what like incredible motivational music. But I had no ins and I had no opportunity in the community in Los Angeles. So I would go to these events and be like, well, where's the opening DJ play? And they're like, no, we all that sorted out. And I would be buying the records, I'd be traveling pretty far to find these sounds. It wasn't such a common thing. Scarcity existed at the time and uh, scarcity of sound. And I, I would just be such a passionate follower and fan, but I also knew I couldn't quit. I, I had both resolved myself because of passion, but also because I had taken on a cultural identity that music was the highest order and that being a musician was being a priest of that order. And if I were to stray from that path, I'd be letting myself down, potentially my family, and these people who had invested both in my identity and in, indeed in, in my education, which I had already, again, failed out of, but in a good way. Also, I had discovered right in the same university period of time that I had quite a bit of dyslexia. And it's funny to go through things. Uh, I went through a whole school career being sometimes in honors classes and sometimes doing very poorly in classes, but always just blaming myself in a poor work. You know, just spending too much time on music. It was easy. Music was just the easy answer to so many problems and questions. But that dyslexia also began to, to rumble in me a question mark of broken things that needed fixing and that perhaps it wasn't music first, but perhaps it was those broken things where the music medicated and started to go on a journey where I discovered that most of my peers also dedicated music fans and passionate listeners and sometimes jazz musicians and otherwise, they also had tremendous amounts of broken things. That's in the most generic way of putting it. I would ask you, uh, probably most of you have a practice, maybe most of you are musicians. Were you first musicians or first practitioners or first artists because it was just a purity and a light or because of your own dark? Let's just put it in those terms. I know these are, these are really unfounded phrases, maybe a little bit weighted. Let's not dwell too much, but just generally, your broken things, your darknesses, your travails, your problems, your family life. What was it, the motivation? What's the spark? What's the, the coal that burned and made some fire that said that music or art was the answer? I think a lot of times intrinsically, there is a self-fulfilling force, there's a self-problem, there's an addictive issue, there's genetics, there's these things that maybe run through us that cause answers to show up at the right time, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but the way we exude them, the way we utilize them, and then again, culturally, the way we've held these artists to esteem. And as I progressed again in my own distinct, my own distinct journey that maybe embodies some of your own, I discovered that a lot of times the DJ culture that I so wanted to be part of because they lived and breathed this loud music that just like rumbled through your body, at this point was a lot of drum and bass. I just loved it and it just ran. But I noticed a lot of the DJs would get drunk every night to have the courage to take a stage. And then later when it wasn't drunk, when it was high, and later when it was blackout, but they would still oftentimes embody their audience. They would be a reflection of the people there but whereas the people there would do it one night a week, a lot of these DJs would do it every night of the week. And some of them uh, realized maybe some of their transgressions and others, they just like, that was the state of mind to which they could fulfill best the, the kind of the workplace rigors. You know, you have to be, you're not only the, um, you're kind of the master of ceremonies oftentimes as a DJ. You're, you're picking the mood, you're, you're setting the tone, but you're also in many ways you are the uh, reflection of the audience up on stage. You are meant to be the embodiment, their personification. I, I didn't do those things. I, I didn't drink. I, I don't know why I never started drinking. I should have. I mean, every, every, all my peers were doing it, but I just, I was on a slightly different uh, trip, so to speak, and uh, that just made it so alcohol didn't show up in my life so much. But that isn't to say that I didn't develop some other tics 
to deal with the stage fright and the nerves and the jitters and the what to play and these question marks, that again, soothed for some others by alcohol and addiction uh, for myself, I, I kind of kept a more narrow path, but I also noticed I wasn't getting booked. And it wasn't just because of community, it was because I also didn't party right. I didn't like work the addiction properly. I didn't, didn't function that way. And I noticed that I, that I wasn't going I wasn't gonna get a yes. So the only way to go was to make my own community and starting to forge that became this, this beat scene in LA, wonderful like-minded people. Um, but it didn't mean that these like-minded new people who didn't necessarily embody the drink or the drug culture of the previous generation, they didn't not have a whole bunch of disorder. They just dealt with it slightly differently, be it the weeded out nature of some or the, the kind of different immolation, the different drugs, the different ways to deal. And so this kind of brings up a different part of my history that's a little bit tough to kind of speak out loud because there was a certain moment where you start collect these like-minded people that kind of have a, a BPM in mind or a kind of sound and a heartbeat that we kind of share and it felt like a movement, a wave was brewing. And then slowly but surely some of these same peers start to die because of accidents, uh, car accidents, because of drug mixtures that they never intended, um, lifestyle choices that they never were cognizant of. They just, it, they lived the actions that bred the day-to-day -day creativity, the way to borrow into this wild electricity. And the sound that we didn't understand because we never talked about it. It was just like, oh, how do we, how do you get the technique, not how do you deal with the outcomes, your life choices, the, the things. And as these people pass, you saw some sobering effects on some, some peers, but then you also just started to see in general, people drop out of the music. I've had enough of an arc that I've seen generations come and go. It's beautiful. People who come into their sound, they, they find a voice in this kind of mess, this noise, this cacophony, and they run its course. They find a way out into a different part of their life, be it sometimes children, be it life, uh, life goals that don't include music. But oftentimes, unconsciously, it's hard not to think that those people quit. They dropped out because they stopped believing in the power of the thing or the, the nature of it. And I don't blame culture in total. I know I've just eaten of it so much that the artist is a genius and that genius has to be held to a different order and that music isn't Music isn't work, and it isn't, isn't, isn't in service of culture. It is the art form, and it is the only. And that's, that's a lot of weight. That's a lot of heavy, and people can't always deal with that. I can't always deal with that. And I found it useful to use a set of tools that I heard in some therapy that was helping other parts of my life that started to help me identify some of the travails so in, in psychological terms, in some usage, there is this term called HALT, H-A-L-T, which stands for hungry, angry, lonesome, tired. And any one of those things is supposed to be a possible trigger for a psychotic episode, for instance, just for instance, or, or other disorders, like whatever you might have spectrum-wise, like that could be a trigger, like watch out, if you get too hungry, you get hangry, you can uh, eat a Snickers quick or whatever their campaign is. And uh, I don't know if you have Snickers again here, but yeah, anyways, <laughs> you can do these things and get like, try to deal with it. Um, and of course, uh, success as a musician means you are all those things all the time because at my, like my most booked year, like the year that was like, oh, this is happening, I had 175 shows in a year. And that isn't counting the to and from, that's just gigs. This was like, the top. This is like what you've been working for all, all of these uh, long, sweaty hours in dark, dingy places to play a lot and to uh, make a living and to like bring your sound to people and to, to do it. So 175, probably the like well majority of the year away from loved ones, away from family, away from food or at least comforts. And, and indeed, hotel surfing, and, and those of you, again, many of you know this in part or in full, many of you might again look at me and be like, this is ridiculous, just buck up, suck it up, enjoy it. This is like a trip, beautiful journey and stuff. And it, 
Sure, it, absolutely, 100%. But it's also a series of triggers and psychological disorders that if at root, uh, if you just let breed and sit, it, it, there's no good outcomes. There's just burnout. But we want that from our artists, seemingly. We want that from our, our muses and our mediums. We want them to make order of, of our chaoses and our discomforts and to, for a night, to go visit them on their little stage mountaintop or whatever and kind of see it happening and to know that it's gonna stay with them while you leave, and it's them. But when you're up on that stage, and you're not thinking about any of these things consciously, you're just going through the motions because you've gone necessarily from clarinet, say, or whatever your instrument is, and you've just taken the time, worked the steps, and just been unconscious to the outcomes, you'll, you'll be up on that stage at one point terribly tired, sick, and just hold yourself that you can't say no because that would be potentially letting someone down. And you've forgotten long ago why exactly you did. The money helps and the, the joy it brings helps, but you kind of start to dislodge that from yourself because it's rote, it's practice, it's not, not um, intentional. And so getting back to halt, the hungry, angry, lonesome, tired, it's really strange to identify. It's easy to tell that your stomach's rumbling, but it's really hard sometimes to know that you're dehydrated. It's a really simple one. Hopefully something that you guys have all been taking care of today to degrees. There is water provided. Um, and in that beautiful spot of nourishing oneself, you're also taking a moment necessarily in your body. Same thing with anger. There is an emotional thing that is adrift in all of us. And anger is a funny... Is a funny uh, kind of a set of emotions because sometimes it is just that, that one word, anger, but oftentimes it's also disillusionment, pettiness, jealousy. There's a whole spectrum of, of kind of feelings and emotions that you might not even realize you're directing outward. It might be going inward. And sometimes it's by uh, a very unfair and cruel world that is just enacting on you and you just want to set those emotions in play. You, you think that the passion is useful, and you think that it's gonna help you in your journey towards art. And of course, we have this belief that you have to suffer as an artist, right? That's like, that's the gold mine. You can write a book about it. But, uh, I mean, you probably can write a book about it. But, but then, needless to say, it, it isn't necessarily part of the, what, is, what I would like to point towards is a more pure artistry, a more, a place that exists in sound itself that doesn't need our ego involved. If anything, between all these different functions and their dysfunction, the, the less we put it into ourselves, the less we hold this stuff dear, the more it can actually achieve the success that probably was going to either way. We're great conduits. We're amazing lightning rods. And you just have to be, have a, like the positive charge to do so often. So tired or lonesome, let's do lonesome last, so, but that doesn't make the acronym all nice, but tired. When you're not sleeping, you're not really present, right? I'm sure we've all felt this in these hard moments. I mean, I would hope that those of you out there are getting some sleep, but probably not, knowing our modern existence, probably no sleep ever. The machines ask a lot. Our attentions are very adrift. Um, and tiredness is a profound one as well because we're not only not dealing uh, with, with our conscious lives and letting, letting that rest be a silence in a moment, or at least not a, like a less conscious moment, but also literally the physiology. Your brain is trying to wash itself like a laundromat. It needs that sleep to kind of get rid of the, the pollution, the particles in the brain, and this is all sciencey stuff. And indeed, also with the toning, you know, you're like kicking off some of that same thing. I think there's some science in that direction too. That the sound bath can help move that stuff around. But so when you're not sleeping, you're building a plaque in your brain. And that plaque doesn't go away just through not sleeping for like seven days and then getting some rest. You have to like do some really fundamental things. So the average tour cycle that again, we think of as success, like the play a show, then drive for 12 hours to the next show, or fly a bunch, you're, you're not ever letting that stuff go. It, it rumbles in a way. And, and then finally with the lonesomeness. Now, there is a profound thing to say, not only, I've often been a solo musician, but also just in an audience, you are receiving and sending music back and forth. There is something so beautiful about that. But again, if it's unconscious, if it goes without thought, I think in a lot of ways that, that connection doesn't happen. And, 
no matter if we're talking about the intimacy of two or the intimacy of a room, you can easily be in a, a, a city full of people and be totally adrift, be disconnected, because we're not letting the sound, so to speak, connect us. And it's easy to find the practice to be very flat, the artistry to be very still, and the lonesomeness to be the only thing that we have left to hold on to. And of course, there's that terrible, absolute other thing where all these different elements become our, our ideal of success. That when we're at our hungriest, our lonesomest, our most isolated, that somehow this is the, the highest form. This is the art. And that inversion, I think, is part of the danger and also part of the joy of being a musician right now. Because in many ways, this is our media environment, this is our, our cultural ideal, and we have every opportunity to totally change that, revolutionize the idea of being an artist. Get back to artisanal, <laughs> what a term, but yeah, get back to craft, get back to making music as a, a tool that we utilize and it's something that we talk about and understand and embody. And so again, for my own journey, just to circle back to that, I had my adrift days, I had my, my distinct movement away from, from partnership and a married life and finding that you can't sustain every outcome. You can't sustain the music without necessarily getting more cognizant of what you're trying to say in that sound. And as well, with dance music specifically, the cultures around it, if you are ignorant of the things that people are doing off stage, you are enabling and allowing. And so to even just be here today and speaking out loud about that feels wonderful. This feels great. I never get a chance to talk about this stuff. Yeah. But that being said, I, I really hope that indeed in your own practice, that this can spark something that you can speak to your friends and neighbors and DJs, what they're doing and how they're doing it and why they're doing it. That's, that's a big one. This is a very useful construct and I, I think that's useful. And sometimes just being very present and, and like how much time do you actually have? What are you here to do? These are good questions to sort out and it's kind of rooty. But also on a much more like practical way, like what are you trying, like how much are you demanding of ears? Like are you really trying to do a full length record right now in this day and age? Like <laughs> it's great. It's so incredibly foolish and wonderful to, to just rally against the kind of cultural forces that are asking that music is more passive and more background and more commercial than it is inspiring, uplifting, uh, worthy of your entirety. It's a lot of, lot of like, difficult territory to navigate. And so uh, I don't think it's uh, something to take on lightly, but at the same, same time, there's never been a better time to be uh, constructed in sound. There's never been a better time to be developing tools and kind of putting forth ideas that could resonate in others and, and create possibilities that don't need to ask eyes or ears uh, the same way. We are total people and we listen with our entire body. This is beautiful, but indeed, um, ears have a special place, you know? They don't ever turn off. They're just there waiting for beautiful things. Not just the fight or flight of like a deep bass wub or something, you know? The kind of instant motor, uh, motor responses that we feel. Like there's so many nuanced places that if you, if you if you just put the right song together, you can get to. It's fantastic. So I know I've been blathering on um, and kind of circling this kind of idea of my own and yours, hopefully. But I also definitely want to make sure that there's questions, very practical questions we can talk about career-wise in music, um, if you want, but also heady, nonsensical questions that we can also get into um, because that's probably more my wheelhouse anyways. Thank you so much, Alfred. Definitely. Thank you. Wow. So, is there a mic going around? Yes, there is. Hey. Over there, Sarah. Uh, are there any questions, please? There doesn't have to be. I can just keep talking. You can, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there is one here. You were mentioning um, bringing music back to a almost artisanal state, 
of it. Um, and you also mentioned that in this day and age, the cultural shift is mostly having music more of a, as a background thing. Then, how, with that, how should we approach it so to make it more its own craft? I would say. Yeah, I. It's it's partially a societal challenge versus a personal challenge. I think if you find purpose and meaning in the act of creating, I think there's something beautiful to that. It doesn't have to interact with society at large. It can be just for you or it can be for your community, your circle of friends, the people right next to you, and that's beautiful and meaningful. In terms of interacting with society, sound is profound and your voice has a profundity to it. I think in many ways to know clearly what you're trying to communicate in a song or in a, in a style of music or in a set and a performance, I think both is not only uh, makes for a clear message, but also adds clarity to the communication with those around you. Because music, of course, does transcend language. It can be so uh, playing on automatic functions in our body. And there is so much to do and to say with it. But it is, since it's a temporal art, I think if you are, are cognizant of the way it's transmitted, then you, you can have ownership over it in a much more profound and, and holistic way. That being said, I do think it's worthwhile doing ridiculous things. It's not just Dadaism, it's not just like a philosophy, it's just we live in an age of nonsense and if you don't reply in kind, you're doing a, a disservice. So a little bit of nonsense every now and then is just absolutely needed. Um, and sometimes that's exuberance. I mean, I really appreciate ASMR and some of these other outgrowths of audio culture, which it may not work in you, but you know it exists and that's great. That's like, you may not have the ear for ASMR or you may not have, be synesthetic per se, or you might not have disorders that yield certain results of, of kind of audio outcomes. But at the same time, the fact that they exist or the fact that you can tap into that and if you have access to some of those innate issues, then maybe it is time more than ever to express and to regard and to, to, to be part of. In terms of the long form record too, that's a lot of time to ask people, but I do feel like there's still art to be made that is more demanding. We don't have to be easy. Easy though um, is what most people, the baseline, so to exceed that is to succeed at a different, uh, a different game maybe. There's something to that, yeah. Cool. One more question somewhere? Right yeah, there. I think we have one right here, Sarah. Hi. Hi, thank you for, for sharing, it's very, very inspiring and, and it makes me think of the, um, the dark side of being a successful uh, electronic artist and, and resonates with, uh, recently I saw the documentary True Stories uh, about Avicii and you know how he was doing like 280 gigs a year and, and all that. Yeah. So, uh, and a lot of people are, are in a less fortunate situation in a way and there's uh, even less awareness and especially in the subcultures. So, um, do you mind sharing, did you find any tips, you know, things that you found were useful in terms of mental hygiene or physical hygiene to make sure that, you know, you were keeping on track even when you were facing this kind of paradoxical state where, you know, you're at the top, you're, you're, you're successful, but inside it can be very difficult to deal with. I think um, absolutely, and thank you so much for that. And Indeed, Avicii is such an interesting example because I think many didn't know that he struggled, even though he was a little bit more of a voice. You don't necessarily take those struggles seriously because they seem to be making so much and being so present, and, you know, omnipresent in our cultural uh, milieu. That being said, um, I think in one way that you can really profoundly both affect uh, your own mental state and others around you is to speak out loud about these issues. If you are going through a tough time, we obviously have every way of doing so, every conveyance, every extension of our nervous system and voice through the internet allows you to be a vocal participant in your society and your culture, but especially to friends and trusted, trusted peers. To, to be open and frank with them, both about your own feelings and behavior and theirs. If you, sometimes obviously people aren't ready to hear their, their hard, harder truths about their own behavior, but by simply bridging that gap, I think sometimes you can, you can arrest your own feelings um, you, of, of meaninglessness or of, of, of uh, wandering, you know, it's like, a lot of times these issues are such that you just don't know where it sits, you don't know how to address the reality at hand, and so just by being vocal and out loud is huge. But then also, of course, that halt thing is silly, but it's real. Like, 
if you give yourself just time to really sort out your feelings, not, it's, it's kind of like silence in a way. Not silence, not the silence of, of a lack of sound, but the silence of letting the loudness of the world dissipate and seeing if you're hungry, seeing if you're lonesome, seeing if you're angry, seeing if you're tired, seeing if you're adrift and just decoupled from your reality. And indeed, if, if you have family history, if you have friends history, if it, things tend to, to not just, you know, as dark as it is, uh, suicide, depressive thoughts. These are all very contagious parts of our society. And it's, it, there's, there's fundamental science to it. If you, if you are angry and you're out loud, other people will become angry and excited. And, and equally, if you, if you have personal thoughts and feelings that are, are even close to those, I mean, it's very brave to, to be aware and to, be, uh, to kind of let those things take place and to hopefully seek help. And if help isn't near, then just give yourself a pause and a moment and a breath and then let that breath ground you and do all the intonating, do all the things that you've ever heard that might give you a, either a real or a placebo effect. It's incredible what the power of the brain can be and how it can enact in the body, but most of it is just giving yourself a chance, just giving yourself even a half a moment. And most of the people I know that have that have passed, it's been unexpected, thankfully, but not entirely. Some of them have conspired towards these things, but a lot of them, they just weren't cognizant of the cocktail that was in front of them or the, what the car they were getting into. It, it'll change over time. I'm sure I'll get older and the, the, the nature of these kind of things will change, but for a lot of these peer group, including Avicii, it's like, it didn't seem totally like he was in control. And you just have to wonder if there was just people around that weren't just trying to get out the next big hit from him, you know, you, if the documentary kind of goes through this a little bit, it's, it's tragic, but it's amazing the, if you can just allow yourself to be present in your reality, how potent that can be. Thank you. That's a great question. Two more. Yeah, one more. Two more. Two more. Hi. Uh, just curious about your, you talked about, like, your success and, and you know, touring these kind of insane numbers of shows in a year. I'm like, I'm also getting to music now for the first time uh, since a while, and I'm kind of struggling with these questions of like, what do I want to do with it? Like, what is that um, new version or vision of success? Um, so I'm curious about your, where you're at now, um, or how you look at that. I, um, I've had to both um, look at this more critically because the festival scene has eaten up small shows. I adore playing to like 150 people uh, or, or that kind of, those kind of numbers, right? Like those kind of numbers where you can see everyone in the eye and you, you're all on the same page and you're maybe moving towards a goal. But then when you're playing in front of like 10,000, I know this sounds ridiculous and it's only happened to me on a couple occasions where I'm playing in front of orders of magnitude. It, it just becomes, uh, I, I myself and maybe my disorder, uh, my reasoning, start to think about the percentages, like somebody's born on that festival ground, somebody died on that festival ground. I played shows like that, I, and I, I can hear you guys giggling, um, and that's, I appreciate that, but it's really strange to have your name on a flyer and know somebody died at that show. It's, it's hard, it's hard to go and do another, of uh, something similar. Um, I sometimes I'm on the festival circuit, sometimes I'm not. And, and for me, it's, it's kind of a game of a question mark of you want to be contributing to this culture, not only because personally it, you know it's not sustainable, but also because it's eating all the small shows. It's harder to have other voices participate when there's just a few acts that are touring the whole festival season. For me, success is, in, is increasingly becoming opportunities like this to talk frankly uh, about issues that I, I care about and also to indeed like have sound, this most prized and very personal thing to me be something that's part of a culture that's wider and, and really elevated. And so I'm, so like I'm involved in this immersed here in Montreal, but then in LA we're doing another one in two weeks and like more of this, really important to me. Um, and oh, thanks. Uh, but, but in, indeed also, like, I'm still putting out records, still putting my fist at the sky and just saying, like, fuck the music industry. If they just want singles, I'm not going to participate. 
I'm not going to sell records. I made that determination a while ago. But that being said, I, I don't care. And that's, oh man, it was so good to stop caring, to like work with labels that were like, why don't you put more bells in your music? People love bells right now. <laughs> that was an actual note I got from an A&R. Yeah, it was great. It was great. And I was like, what kind of bells? Like, <laughs> yeah. They didn't know either, I swear. Uh, but, you know, and then later I was dropped off that label because they, I didn't have, you know, it, there is a game that is being played and it's easy to kind of look at it as being like, oh, this is like Bitcoin. Like, you know, you, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, but it's like, it's, it's like a, no offense to anybody who's like a cryptocurrency person here, but it's like a big, it's like a pie in the sky. It's like for somebody else to make money. It's for some other, it's pretty much for the people at the top of the food chain to be making. And then, you know, you're, you're drudging along and sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, but it's, it's like the free market. It's just like not, it's going to eat us all. So like more increasingly, it's being part of, of a conversation and like an intimacy that's making me happy. And I hope whatever your journey is, it sounds like you're getting back in, I hope you can see it for the joys that it gives you immediately and as well as the profound joys that you'll get to if you just stick with it a little while without any of the illusions. Definitely. Last one. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, hey. So thank you for that. That was really awesome. Um, and I picked him up the other day from the airport and I, we were talking about his talk and you did great. Like We talked about it. Um, I'm, re I'm really happy to hear conversations about this. I have also lost a lot of friends over the past few years uh, in the Bay Area um, through many different things, the ghost ship fire being one of them. Um, so I, I wanna ask a question. I know you're talking about it from the artist perspective, but I am not an artist. I, am a, I have in the past organized festivals. I was a booking agent. I've done lots of different things within the music scene. And so I also, when I was a booking agent and when I threw festivals, noticed how hard it's been for so many people and when, how many people get divorced or break up or end up addicted to something after their tour or they're just a mess, you know, and come home and, you know, the group of friends tries to pick them back up and then it's just, it's a cycle. And then you're happy for the next person that gets to go on tour and then the same thing happens and it happens again and, and there's no stability. So from the perspective of people throwing parties and throwing festivals and trying to promote and you know, keep the community and scene going through these events, what do you think we can do to make it better for artists? Yeah, That's, I'm both so sorry for your experience, but also thank you so much for sharing. I, I um, first of all, uh, specifically, no matter if it's the biggest festival or smallest get together, just gathering, intentionality, having your booking reflect a diverse stand, set of standpoints. Um, sound itself, I think, can lack cultural trappings, and yet it is intrinsically a cultural act. So let's let's be cognizant of that, and let's like push that thing forward. Let's have a wide breadth of voices. Um, and especially if you have the opportunity as a booking agent or as, a, as an, indeed, as, as, at any point, as an audience member, as a, as, a, as a festival organizer and everything in between, just demand more from your sound environment. Demand more of the, the people who are giving us culture and in many ways of our sound environment. You go to a show and it sounds shitty, nobody's gonna get anything ask for good speakers, ask for good artists, ask for a diversity of voices, be noisy, be the squeaky wheel. Those are really good things. Um, have conversations about the political nature of sound. Be aware of our sound space. Are you guys familiar with sound studies as an idea? Like, it's a really interesting part of like socio-anthropological socio idea of sound where it's not only conveying a uh, a set of melody and notes, but also cultural ideas, and and it, our sound floor, the the noise around us is is gonna inform so much of our identity, and so just to be aware of that and to like yell at it, give it energy, you know, you are gonna get out what you put into it, um, but also be very aware of the opposite side that your participation isn't 
you know, the world isn't relying on you. There is others. You're in a community for a reason. Lean on people. Give them energy. Give them difference. Do difference. Give them purpose and place. And I think you'll find that the whole thing works better. Especially listening. Oh, be an active listener. Oh, it's so good. Listen with your heart and like be really intentional with your listening and like be really quiet and like let it all come. And then when you think you're like, oh, I'm going to say something like, no, 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 just shut up and like listen some more and then say something. It's beautiful. It's a really good thing to do all the time. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> I also started with the clarinet, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah. clarinet, clarinet, anywhere? Whoop, oh, yourself. fantastic. Wait, so real Meet quick. downstairs at the bar. I have, I have my own. My own theory, how many of you are electronic musicians? A few, a few, okay, many. How many of you either played keyboards, DJ, or bass? Just those. Yes, I'm right, yeah, for some reason, that's the gateway drug. Yeah. Okay, cool. cool. Yeah. Any closing words that was so interesting I didn't want to butt in? So. No, uh, dang. Um, Thank you all very much again. You, you are, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this is the heart and soul of Montreal here tonight. So thank you so very much. There's going to be some other experiences to be had and hopefully just like give it your spit and vinegar all tonight and today. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.